Welcome to the Learning with Lowell podcast. I am Lowell Thompson, and my lifelong love of learning saved my life. A few years ago, I was in and out of the ER and ICU with no end in sight due to, at the time, a mysterious illness. I read medical journals, talked to scientists and researchers, and learned how to develop a good treatment plan, all of which put me on the path to becoming healthy, which I am now. I have met the team responsible for creating the drug that saved my life. And now I'm taking my experiences and love of learning and translating them into interviews with experts, CEOs, and scientists in order to achieve three goals in every episode. To have fun and interesting conversations that are enjoyable to listen to, to learn what these people are developing and creating, to hear what their tactics, strategies, tools, books, and resources they use to accomplish what they were doing, so that you can learn, apply, and see what else is out there and enrich your life with every episode. Additionally, there will be an email capture in the show notes specifically for people who want to help and learn more about this Kickstarter I'm running next month. It is related to bees, so if you've ever asked yourself, how am I helping out the bees, considering they lost 40% in the U.S. alone last winter, then sign up for the newsletter and you'll get weekly updates about the developing problems in beekeeping and bees specifically and bee researchers as well. So I'll leave that there. Check it out. Uh, it's going to be amazing. You guys are, for longtime listeners and fans who have been messaging me on ways you can be supportive, this is a big way. So even if you just send that email capture to your, your Twitter, being like, hey, this guy's working on something, that'd be really helpful. If you want to sign up yourself, that's amazing as well. Remember, show notes, check it out, and it'll be labeled as well. Today we're joined with Christina Thompson, unrelated to me. She is the author of Sea People, The Puzzle of Polynesia. And Come On Shore and We Will Kill and Eat You All. So two really interesting books. Pa, uh, the Come On Shore just came out this year, so you probably going to want to pick that up. She's gotten multiple awards and uh, prizes for her writing because she's fantastic at it. She's an editor for the Harvard Review. You name it, this person's done it. She is a dual citizen of the U.S. and Australia, which is pretty cool. And we actually get into her uh, life story a bit in the discussion. We center very much on Polynesia, but... Uh, as well as uh, some interesting aspects that you only can get from having a, a life like hers. And at the end, we have the usual, you know, what problems have you had? What do you need help with? And what are some great books? And we, we get some book recommendations here. So stick in, kick your feet back, listen to Christina Thompson, who is not related to me. That would be cool if she was. And let's enjoy this interview. Also, this is part two of two. Check out part one last uh, that came out last week. Thank you. When you're talking about languages, it made me think of, uh, I, for the longest time I tried learning Spanish. I would not say I've been successful, but uh, I learned that in, I learned, I like learning more about like the history of where the languages come from. And in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, where like Spain is, uh, there's a, I think it's called Cotillion, where there's like, there's a language in the north where the mountains are, where mm. they're not sure where it comes from. I wonder if there, if there are any languages like that in Polynesia where it's distinct enough that they can't trace it back based on. Um, I think it's called antonyms or uh, like simile, like the similarities with other uh, languages. Uh, yeah, that's so Basque is one of the languages that is hard to place like Hungarian. I mean, there are languages in Europe that don't, it's not so much that they don't really know where they come from is that if they don't belong to the family, the, the dominant language family, which is Indo-European. So Spanish and Portuguese and French and English and Greek and, you know, a lot of all the languages of Europe, plus all the languages of Iran, some of the languages of, um, you know, the, anyway, they all belong to this Indo-European language family, and there's a few outliers in there. Um, that is not true in Polynesia. It is definitely true in the Western Pacific. In Polynesia, all the languages belong to the same group. They're actually a very recent, comparatively recent branch of a big family called Austronesian. But if you go to the Western Pacific, you have these mixtures of Austronesian languages and then what they're called Papuan languages, which are much older languages and there are lots of them and it's really complicated, like what language families they belong to and, uh, you know, they, the people who speak them, those, those, they have had a long time to evolve in those locations. The, the number of languages that you have in a place is often a me measure of time because it means that the people have been there a long time and there's been a lot of time for the languages to split and split and split and change and change and change, which is what they do over time. So the Polynesian languages kind of have begun to split apart 
Tahitians a little different from Hawaiians, a little different from Maori, you know, but they're pretty close because they're pretty, the splits are pretty recent. So there's nothing, there's no weird outliers there. Hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. The, that makes sense. I, um, I, I also thought that maybe like population size is a, a factor because I, I wouldn't imagine there's a lot of people in Polynesia. I wouldn't think that there's like in, in, a lot in compared to like China. So maybe like more oh. people and time helps like create new like uh, new, new uh, variants in language because more people are interacting with it. I, you know, maybe. I mean, it does mainly it's a matter of time, I think, because mm-hmm. you can have these very small language groups in the Western Pacific and Melanesia around Pap- like in Papua New Guinea. There's 750 languages in Papua New Guinea or something like that. And that's really just a function of the fact that people have been there for tens of thousands of years. And there's been a lot of time for those languages to change. It's, I mean, it's one, it's a function of that, plus maybe other cultural factors because they, they kept to themselves. But it's not necessarily because there are so many people. It's more mm. that the, the languages have, have sort of split apart and gone their separate ways. Um, and they've had a long time to do that. So, so that's kind of an interesting thing about languages, yeah. Yeah. And languages are weird. The... Um... I wanted to study them at one point in my life. I just think it's interesting. Like language and uh, religion, I think like they're like the cornerstones of what culture are. And I don't know, I think it's an interesting thing. But one of the questions I definitely wanted to ask you, and this this touches back on uh, a little bit on the, the idea that Moana exists and the idea that there are so many different characters and mythologies and, and um, people in Polynesia that most people would not get to hear about. Um, and thankfully you've written books and there's other books on this, on these subjects, but if you were to create like a movie or something like that, that would tell as accurate as you would like a story about some characters set in Polynesia that, that are from Polynesia, are there, are there stories and or people that you would highlight or have a part of this? Like, and then what story would they be? It's like, mm-hmm. basically the question is like, you get to make your own movie, you get to have as big of a budget as you want. And, um, I imagine you'd want it to be, a uh, you know, lifelike in the sense that um, accurate to the people, but what, what would be the stories they'd want to tell? Well, I think, so uh, one of the areas I know something about is uh, New Zealand, early New Zealand history. And I, I do think that there's some pretty interesting stuff that happened. I mean, there are some movies like there's a movie called Utu, which is pretty great in New Zealand. Um, And which is about the early colonial period, but there, there were some responses to the arrival of outsiders on the part of chiefs in various locations. This was true in Hawaii, um, Kamehameha, the first, who was the first king, the guy who unified the Hawaiian islands was probably in some ways influenced by, or in his decisions and behavior by uh, the idea that there was all these, there were these outsiders coming. Certainly in New Zealand, um, the, uh, there were chiefs in the North who had contact with Europeans early and were very interested, for example, in trading for guns. And they made some really significant, interesting decisions about how to interact with uh, ship's captains and, you know, naval authorities and so forth in order to further their own agendas locally. Like they were definitely thinking about how to use these new arrivals in ways that would uh, advance their own causes, their own objectives. And so, which in many cases involved tribal warfare. So I just think that those interactions were really, would be fun to sort of have a story in which all those players in that early kind of period, sort of 10 or 20 years where you know, they just, not everybody, people just don't really know what the other people want and what's going on. Um, And yet they're kind of taking advantage of each other in different ways. Uh, I think that would be kind of (laughs) cool. I think it's an interesting period. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. The, I I imagine it more like the Rome TV series, like a, like where like every couple of seasons it it shifts like a decade or two. Yeah. That would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting. That because because you could have before and then you could have the arrival. And I mean, it's not like like a lot of people think that, you know, 
the arrival of like Europeans in say the British or whatever in New Zealand, that was just boom, that was it. And that's, everything was bad after that. And a lot of things, bad things did happen. I mean, Europeans brought among other things, just as in, in America, they brought a lot of diseases that uh, people in the islands were not very uh, well defended against. Like they didn't have any immunity to. So a lot, there was a lot of death didn't happen started right away, but it really ramped up in the 19th century later when there was a lot more traffic, whalers, sealers, traders, missionaries, colonial officials, you know, all these people going, who, who, who. But the 19th century is a, is, a, is, a, is a century of really dramatic change in this part of the world. And some of it, most of it pretty hard on the Polynesians, but the early say, stages of it are kind of interesting because it hasn't all gone south yet, you know, like it hasn't all fall. It hasn't come become, I mean, a lot of people have been focused on how bad it was and it was pretty bad. I have to say, uh, in the long run. Um, but, but in the beginning it was kind of complicated and interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd watch that. The, it reminds me of this. Um, it's like it very smallly reminds me of this idea that someone put to me of a TV series where like the, have you ever seen the office? Yeah. Okay. The um. Well, the English, uh, the American one, not the British one, but the, I mean, either one, I guess, would have been fine. But the um. So the idea would be that you would go th through a couple of seasons of The Office, like a uh, Office type show, and like you'd sprinkle in that as disasters coming, like just like offhand comments, and then like the third season would be like an apocalypse happens, and then like <laughs> them dealing with that, and like, it would be such like uh you know a, a split over, but like I imagine like that complicated like, scenario. Like Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But with a better ending, you know, <laughs> people who actually want to finish it. Well, uh, they did not want to finish it. Like people, they, they gave, they said they could have as many seasons as they want. Um, and they, they would like wanted to finish it up and now they get Star Wars, which is probably not a good sign, but um, I won't go there. It bugs me. Um, that ending was horrible. But the, so anyways, the, if you were, uh, if you were, were to recommend like maybe like five books that people who want to learn more about Polynesia, other than your two books will be, which will be in the show notes. Um, I guess you could recommend your own, but uh, what are some of the, some, some really good books or resources that you'd recommend people check out? Um, there is a book by a guy named Sam Lowe, L O W called Hawaii rising, which is about the early years of the Hokulea, which is where we started, but we started off talking about, which is the Polynesian voyaging canoe. And it's a pretty great book. It's, a, it's on Amazon. You can get it there. Um, it's not widely known, but I like it a lot. I, I thought it's all based on uh, interviews with people. So it's really testimony about what happened in those, in that interesting early period when the canoe was being built um, and first sailing. So that was one. Um, this guy named Patrick Kirch, uh, who is the Polynesian anthropologist or archaeologist, wrote a book called On the Road of the Winds, which is sort of like a kind of a biggish book about Polynesian archaeology. But it's really well written and really readable and has a ton of information and also great illustration in it. So I would recommend that to anybody who's interested in Polynesian archaeology. There's a there's a there's a really interesting book by a woman named Elizabeth Matizu Smith. That's M A T I S O O hyphen Smith. She is a geneticist, uh, an anthropological uh, anthropological geneticist in New Zealand, who wrote a book called something like DNA for Archaeologists or something like that, which is like a great little handbook on how archaeologists use DNA, which is something that. Um, is really interesting. Uh, that's again, kind of a, a little niche, but it's a pretty darn good book. There's a big coffee table book called Vaka, V-A-K-A, which has got a whole backstory on the, a whole, whole lot of stuff on um, Polynesian voyaging, but is the, um, is a coffee table book with lots of illustration, very beautifully produced. There is also a book by uh, David Lewis, which I do love. Uh, which is called We the Navigators, We, comma, the Navigators. And that is his book about learning about, it, he, that's really the original book about Polynesian, uh, or sorry, non-instrumental navigation before they had really started doing it when he, based on his interviews with navigators in, the, in Micronesia and in the, in the Santa Cruz Islands. That's a great book. It's a classic. There's a, there's a, there's a, 
there's a missionary book that I like a lot by a guy named William Ellis. Probably can't get that. I don't know. Maybe there's a reprint of it someplace, something like seven year, eight, eight years in the Sandwich Islands or something. But if you like that kind of thing, it's a 19th century book. It's, it's, he's a really good narrator. Um, and he did a lot of observing in Tahiti and the, and the, and Society Islands. I mean, it depends on how esoteric you want to get popular books. Let me think about popular books for a second. Um, esoteric is good too. I mean, every book you've recommended so far, I'm going to read. I read there's a lot. A, there's a book by John Huth, H-U-T-H, who is a professor of physics at Harvard, which is called something like Finding, finding, our, finding Your Way, or no, the, the Lost Art of Finding Your Way, or something like that. It's about orient, it's sort of about being oriented in space, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a book about the science of it. So, you know, how do birds do this and how he, he himself is a, is a kayaker and he, he realized that uh, there was an accident on the Massachusetts coast a couple of years ago where some young people got out in their kayaks, then a fog came in. He was out there at the same time and they died and he didn't, he got back to shore, but he thinks that they did, couldn't figure out how to, tell where the shore was and and so they just wandered off and got lost and drowned um and he made him think about how people don't really understand how to find their way if they don't have their phone or whatever and that is a really great book really interesting because science-based again also really well written well i also think robert louis stevenson's in the south seas is a description of his time in marquesas and the Tuamotus, beautifully written, very fun to read. Short stories by Somerset Maugham on um, set in the Pacific are very wonderful to read. Yeah, Gavin Dawes, G, uh, A Dream of Islands. That's a, that's a book about, um, Dawes is D-A-W-S. That's a book about Gauguin and uh, various people who went out to Stevenson, I guess, and Gauguin and various other 19th century figures who went out, kind of taken by the romance of the South Seas and went out and lived there. It's a very wonderful little set of biographies. That should be enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get us started. The, um, well, th <laughs> thank you. That's that's awesome. The, sometimes it's like people give you like one book recommendation and it's like, ah, you, you wrote a book. I bet you know so many other good books. So this is, this is fantastic. I have, I have, I mean, I have like, uh, I need to add more to my I mean, like nowadays people have like library cards. You can literally get a book on your phone in like two minutes. So people need to read more. Uh, yeah, anyway. and, and also Google Books has made a lot of great 19th century stuff available. Uh, now you can do it. You know, you can just get like a cheap old cheap ebook or whatever. Um, so I think I'm, you know, problematic as Google Books is for authors because there's copyright issues that have been challenging. But it's really great for the stuff that's out of copyright because that stuff was just hard to come by. Mm -hmm. back in the day so yeah cool <laughs> all right um so the there are a couple like last questions I, I like to ask all my guests and uh it's like i guess my control variables but um so the first one is is there a problem that you're having that you would like a listener's help with like you could be researching a new topic for an upcoming book and maybe you need this type of expert or anything like that um just any problem that you're having that maybe someone listening can help Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Well, okay, here's one. So I'm really interested in um, thinking about missionary activity in Polynesia in the 19th century. So that's a little different from the kind of missionary activity that goes on these days, but in some ways it's not that different. But I myself was not raised with much religion, with any religion, in fact, and I don't have a lot of insight into um, what people who go out as missionaries to other cultures, what it is they think they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I get that there is a, a sense of something, of something, but I don't, because I come from, I have a more anthropological view of the world. I think I don't really see how they, why, you know, I mean, I can see if you go, if you're going to like help somebody put in a new water supply, or something like that. But what I can understand really is what happens when you decide you want to go out and, you know, help somebody understand a different religion, like come change their religion. 
So I'm curious about that. I'm, I would love to hear from people who wanted to explain to me without trying to convince me, <laughs> just explain to me how they feel about that. If there's anybody who sort of understands that, that um, perspective, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. But, um... like, I, I, I have confidence that there are people who are, I, I, I'm not negative on this subject. I just, feel as though when I go to look at these, you know, I'm interested in these 19th century figures and I, I, I look at them and I think, what, what did they think they were doing exactly? Like, what did they believe they were doing? And I read their writings, but it doesn't quite give me the sort of emotional insight that I want in terms of, of their, their confidence level or their, their vision of their, and I think there may be something that's common to people who, who regardless of exactly which particular faith it is. You know the evangelical, the evangelizing desire. This must be. There must be. That must be something. Hmm. Does that sound kind of ridiculous? Is that like a bad idea to ask? No, I don't think it's a bad idea. <laughs> I, don't, I, mean, I, I don't think any questions are bad. I, no, I think it's good. It reminds me of a a movie that might be helpful to you. Is the it had the guy who played Kylo Ren in it? He was a marine, and it's like it's like a the last couple of missionaries that went to Japan. Hmm. It's like it's I forget what it's called. Oh, um, if you think of it, email me. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. The... Yeah, that would be interesting to me. I, 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 okay, I mean, that might be just a silly thing to ask people because it may be that people that there isn't anybody who ever wants to tell anybody about that or or that just is like, or you're just opening the floodgates and that's just a bad invitation. But but I do feel that it's, that I don't have as much insight into this as I wish I had. There has been, there have been some books recently about people who have spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in evangelical communities to understand them who've come from outside. Again, you know what it is, is like, it's me. I feeling like I'm an outsider looking in saying, what, what is this? What, you know, what do people think? What do they, how do they feel? What do they know? That kind of thing. So. Yeah, I don't think, I think that's a good thing. Like it's a good thing to be curious, wanting to understand people. And like, if you feel like you don't know something to, it's better to understand it fully than to not understand it well. Right. And I just know, I don't, I don't come, come at it from a point of view of, oh, this is a bad thing, or this is a dumb thing, or this is a, like a thing that shouldn't happen. I don't feel like that at all. I just feel like I don't get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't, I haven't had any experience of it. That's really what it, what it boils down to. Yeah. How, how are you supposed to figure that out if you don't ask? Then right. find someone who does know. The, right. the movie I was talking about is called Silence. It came out in 2016. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, right. I'll email it to you as well. So right. uh, next question is, the, is there a question you have that is unanswered that you'd love to have answered? Maybe someone in the audience can kind of answer it, but um, it's just like an unanswered question. Granted, you did kind of just pose a question you don't have the answer to, but a different one. <laughs> that, you, that uh, yeah. So, like an example would be: I always wonder if the if the Big Bang makes the universe right. Like that's the idea. If I went back in time and like stopped the Big Bang from happening, what would be here instead? And <laughs> And then what would what was here before the Big Bang? Yeah. Those, th those things bug me. I don't think anybody can answer those for you. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> those are things I, wor I wonder about. So <laughs> do you have anything you wonder about that you don't have the answer to? Uh, uh, I, I wonder, oh yeah, well, I mean, I wonder a lot of things. I wonder tons of things. Um, I do wonder, as we sort of were talking about it, I wonder what it would be like to live in a world without writing. I also wonder, um, yeah, I don't think any, I mean, I don't think too many people know that now. I don't think that's something that people, I mean, there are groups of people who are probably non-literate, um, but that's not because they live in a world where everybody doesn't have writing. It's because they themselves haven't learned it. So that's not really what I mean. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things. I'd like to know how many lost canoes there were. I don't think anybody's going to be able to tell me that either. If anybody has a way of figuring out how to calculate that. Um, I'd like to know what people think that uh, what more information is going to be forthcoming from DNA about uh, human population movements. That's like a thing that is obviously going to change over time. And I don't have much knowledge about where we're going to go with that. But I think people who understand the field better probably do. Mm -hmm. For the, for the idea of lost boats, for, mm -hmm. is there a way like in the, in the, the Moana movie, like they showed a sequence where 
like every now and again, every every X amount of years, they would take like a tenth of the population and bunt out and then go try and find another island. Is there is that like is there a similar ratio of that happening in Polynesia? Because if if you could figure that out, like how like an island of this size with this population, every like X amount of years, like one colony would be sent out or like one group would be sent out, and you kind of could guess over a period of time, like how much that one island would produce in canoes and other things. Yeah, you know, I think that that's probably not the way it really worked. I mean, I think that um, that sort of suggests that there was like a master plan for, you know, colonizing the Pacific. I don't think that's really how it worked. I think how it worked was probably more like, um, you know, people had a dispute and somebody said, uh, you know, you've got to go, or somebody said, I've got to go, and they decided to set out and, and find a new place. Or, you know, an island was, like a, an atoll was swamped in a tsunami, and it was no longer a place they could live. And so they had to set out and find a new place. I don't think it was mostly disaster-oriented. I think it was probably occasionally disaster-oriented, but I think a lot of times it might have been social and political. But I think it was probably sporadic rather than systematic that way. So I think it's unlikely that you could do a kind of a numbers calculation based on like how many people were here and how many people were there and how many people ended up. And Mm. that makes sense. I don't don't know. I mean, I I don't know what the pathway is to figuring out. I don't know anybody who's, who's done it. I I don't, or at least everybody that I've read has guessed about it and the guesses are high or low. You know, some people guess high, some people guess low, but I think it, it, they're all guesses. Mm -hmm. Are there any traditions for when someone doesn't come back? Like if someone does like a scouting mission and come um, and like doesn't come back to like people do anything about that or do, do scouting like, cause I imagine like you're not like just going to send out a huge population of people. They're going to like make sure that like there's an Island there first and then like you'll send out the rest of them. Um, if someone doesn't come back to the, is there like funeral rites that go with that? That I mean, there are, the there are things that people say about, about people who are lost at sea. Yeah. I mean, there are things that people say about it. Some people, um, and there are reactions to it. Yeah, yeah for sure. But people can get lost at sea when well, just fishing, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, people get lost. People go out to sea for a lot of reasons, not just to colonize a new island. They go out to sea, they, they travel from one island to another or That's they, true. you know, to trade, for example, there was definitely a lot of tra- trade and, and, or they, or they, uh, you know, they go to get resources, uh, turtles, turtle shell or pearl shell or sea eggs or bird's eggs or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So th- there are a lot of reasons to travel around. Um, and people would get lost periodically, even just doing that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, ho- hopefully someone can like pitch in and, and, and uh, <laughs> help out. The, so the, the last thing, and this is more of an open-ended thing, but if you have a, I don't know, like a quote that you tend to like, or uh, a concept or basically like what's like uh, a thought you'd like to leave us on. And usually I say like pick a quote, but like if you have like a concept you want to share that you want people to like have resounding in their ears as they go on with their day. (laughs) Well, there was a, there's a quote by a guy named Elston Best, who was an ethnographer in New Zealand in the early part of the 20th century. And in one of the books, his books, he wrote, um, about the story of the Polynesian diaspora, the the great Polynesian expansion. He said, uh, could the true story of the Polynesian voyaging, the Polynesian voyaging be known? It would be the wonder story of the world. I always liked that. It it would be the wonder story of the world. And I think the idea is that there is a lot of mystery in this there are a lot of unknowns in this and that's why you know it was possible to write a whole book about it and still leave things out <laughs> but uh you know could the true story be known it would be the wonder story of the world the implication is that we'll probably never know the full true story but we can think about it and that in itself is kind of fun this is part two of two check out last week's episode to get the first one and that was Christina Thompson, author of Sea People, The Puzzle of Polynesia, and Come on Shore, We Will Kill and Eat You All. Check her out at ChristinaThompson.net or Google either of those books or check the show notes. I have links to all this stuff. Other than that, thanks for coming out, and here's my outro. 
Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at LolWasHere, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlol.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.